Welcome back, everybody. I'm Tommy McCarthy, and this is Let's Talk Cyber. Well, it's taken some time to get this young lady on Let's Talk Cyber. Let me tell you, I had more success getting the king to say hello. Oh Dr. Mira Sharma, welcome to Let's Talk Cyber. It's an absolute pleasure to be here, Tommy. I know we took a bit of time, but uh, it's incredible. Yeah, all, th all good things come to he who waits, is what they say. So... Yes. Really interesting subject, actually. Uh, since we last spoke, oh my lord, my head has been in a spin about quantum. So I'm going to ask you, why quantum and why now? But before we go into that subject, Mira, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, where you've come from in relation to your career, and what on earth are you doing in quantum computing and quantum security? Um, Tommy, thank you again for having me. Uh, I'm Mira, the CEO of a company called Sistel. My background, I have a degree in physics. I did my PhD in, um, in cybersecurity, but looking at how hackers develop software. So in that process, I've spent a lot of my time in hacker chat rooms, chasing hackers around the world, sitting down with them, looking at how they develop software. So given the time I spent with them, I got really intrigued by uh, the work they do. And that took me into quantum because the more I read, the more I was trying to look at, is there a way to beat hackers, right? Because they are so good at what they do. They're so fast, so quick, efficient. And looking back, I sort of realized that, well, there is... There was a way in which we need to start thinking about how they actually operate, and that got us into quantum. Yeah. It, it, um, and I've, so I've done, so course of my career, I've done a lot of work with public, private sectors, uh, worked with a lot of companies who have been hacked, and they come to us and ask us to support them, and I've done that, um, and worked in defense sectors, uh, looking at terrorist threats and mapping it against online chatter. Mm -hmm. And so many interesting projects. And I also see on your LinkedIn profile you're in, you're in, you're involved in a few very interesting um, steering groups um, in Westminster of all places. Do you want to tell me a little bit about one or two of the steering groups that you've been involved with? So I've been involved in the couple of EU-led committees that are looking for support. So there are a lot of organizations that are doing work around quantum, and I've been supporting with that. And the APPG is the all-party parliamentary group for cybersecurity, and I've been involved in that for more than a year now. And that's all about the current topics and what can we take and how do we influence uh, the people at the top, really, who are driving this country forward, and how do we get them to look at uh, the latest threats. I've been involved in post. So we got mentioned by the Parliamentary Office for Science and Technology because we were one of the first companies to ever create a job, a new job, which was a quantum cybersecurity consultant. Um, and we were doing lots of interesting things in the quantum governance risk compliance space. So I've been working with Post for over two years now. Interesting. But uh, it's, it, I said a thing at the beginning, why quantum and why now? Because I, I've been researching a little bit and looking at the timelines that people are suggesting for commercially introducing quantum computers into the wider business community, five to 30 years. So why are we discussing quantum safety right now? What, are, we, are, we, are we premature? Are we ahead of the game? I think we spend a lot of time thinking about the timelines of quantum computing and when we get a commercially viable quantum computer. But I think the problem we have now is that date we get it, the, the day we get a commercial QC is already too late. So the problem is cryptographic threats. Uh, it's something for us to think about because we have quantum algorithms, which is something that's called shows algorithm. This can break the RSA ECC encryption that we have, which pretty much underpins all of our modern cybersecurity. So if you take your SSLs, if you take your TLS, VPNs, all of that is based on this. The computers we have today will take about 2 million years to crack RSA, 2 million. But with a quantum computer, that would be minutes. And that's the threat that we are facing today. Uh, there are also issues of, you know, there's something called data harvesting now. So a lot of state-sponsored hackers and other hacker groups, what they're doing is really interesting. They are now collecting data. They're harvesting encrypted data with the hope of decrypting this later. The minute we get a commercially viable quantum computer, and that will be in the hands of hackers, um, and that can cause a lot of chaos. Now, you may think, okay, what kind of data is that data really that important for us? Well, maybe not your and my personal data, but if you think about companies that are storing R&D data, organizations that have IP, 
um, organizations that are dealing with very sensitive information on a national uh, level, all of this becomes uh, very vulnerable with time. And not to mention geopolitics, let's... Uh, if you were to think about what happened recently in, uh, you know, with the power outage in a few countries, a lot of that, imagine the scale and scope of that when we do have a quantum computer and if that can be cracked and if all our data is out there, uh, there's a lot of damage that can be done because of um, this technology in the wrong hands and it could destabilize global security. You know, I just knew that your this conversation this morning was going to put me in a little bit of a spin. I've had two full cups this morning to, to prepare <laughs> myself for this conversation. Wow. <laughs> so it's true. You, yeah. you, Mila, you know, this is the common sense approach to quantum. I've spoken to people in the past and they've tried to bamboozle me all about the quantum concept and quantum computing and, you know, the theory of quantum and all, all the stuff that kind of just gets people on the back foot. So my next question is quite interesting because it addresses the hype around quantum. You know, how can businesses communicate quantum risks to the board without it being regarded as hype? And I'll tell you an example, actually, because since we've last spoken in great detail, I may, I may have had, we've had some great conversations around quantum. I've been speaking to an international bank who have got an entire steering group put together already to address the impending threats that quantum computing is going to bring to their organization. So I would suggest that talking about quantum right now in a boardroom isn't hype, but how can, how can um, businesses communicate that to the board? What's your own opinion on that? This is a really good question, um, Tommy, because I think that's one of the challenges is getting the board to understand because it's such a complex topic, right? Uh, and people, and we all tend to dive into, okay, what is quantum mechanics? What are qubits, et cetera? And I think we need to step away from that and start looking at this as, okay, what is the business impact of quantum? What does it mean? And I think when we talk about security, security really underpins all the wonderful stuff that quantum computers can do. So if we get the security right, on top of that, you can organizations can start scaling and building all those efficiencies that come with uh, quantum computers. So the first step for any organization would be to really go to the board and create a business impact in a case for this, quantify the risk in finance, quantify the risk in operations, use those metrics. Um, so if you think about, so one example would be, for example, that IBM came out and said uh, they did a lot of research and looked at companies that were using quantum sensing. And quantum sensing led, uh, gave companies about 80% operational efficiencies. Um, and all of that needs to come in front of a board. Um, another useful thing to do would be ROI calculations. What does it mean for the company over time? What are the industry benchmarks? Uh, if you look at Fortune 500 company, the adoption rate is rapid. And by 2027, we're looking at more than 50% of Fortune 500 companies adopting quantum on some, on some level. Um, and the key thing here would also be, and I think this is probably the most important one, it would be regulations. The regulations are kicking in. The NCSC in the UK have come out and said, Look, take three years, but get onto the journey now. Start preparing now. NIST have come out and given five algorithms for post quantum migration. Now, that's post quantum migration is not a simple activity. It wouldn't happen in a day, it wouldn't happen in a year. Uh, but I think to understand those first steps is really critical. You know, um, and that, and that goes to the board. Indeed. And, and one point that you missed out. I would be rude to accept that it was my research that did this. You provided this to me. I believe IBM have committed a hundred and fifty billion investment into quantum. That's a very good point. Yes. What exactly? Where's all that money going? That that is unbelievable. So I guess let's look at you know in action. If there's a price to pay for an action, what would it be in relation to a company's um, appetite for risk? Yes. Um, increased costs. So I think any activity that could be done today, if it's moved down the line, when regulations kick in, when the insurance companies start saying, we can't insure your data at rest and your data in motion because it poses, uh, you have to progress threats that you have not addressed. Those risks then turn into losses over time. And I think, and then you end up paying a lot more. So that is the price for inaction. And not to forget, the longer companies wait, the more exposed they become. 
to this and to uh, quantum risk. You know, uh, and again, it highlights, you know, where the appetite for risk would come from, you know, in a boardroom, because obviously uh, companies still don't see cyber as a, as a value add. You know, they always see it as an expense. And I think if you don't take the, the proactive steps here, if you're a huge, large organization, eventually it may come back to bite you where, you know, where you don't want it to bite you. So well, I know we've shared some top secret information about some of the projects you're working <laughs> on. My lips are sealed. Have you got any examples for us about some of the projects that potentially uh, industries and companies are acting on now to ensure that quantum safety is you know, front and center? Any examples you can share yes, with us? Um... Sure. And I think I'm quite, I mean, this, the project we're working on right now is, in fact, it's in the public domain, so I don't mind sharing bits and pieces of it, uh, at least what I can share. Um, so we are working on one of the first of its kind projects in the UK, which is called Quantum Assurance. There is a web, you know, there is a web link to this. It's called cubashore.org. Um, and we are looking at building a you know, quantum cyber toolkit that enables companies to be able to start deploying quantum solutions. Because one of the things that we did not discuss, uh, and this is quite relevant, is you can't just go and buy quantum solutions off the shelf and say, I don't want to do any of the background work, but I just want to start implementing quantum solutions. Uh, that doesn't happen because it's a risk of implementing something you're not fully aware of in terms of how it fits with the overall environment of your particular organization. Uh, so the work we're doing is really quite interesting. We've got companies uh, that we're working with like BT, Toshiba, HSBC, um, NPL. Uh, so the NPL is involved because uh, one of the things that we're doing here would be setting standards for the UK uh, in terms of rolling out in a quantum key distribution. Uh, and there are other companies doing wonderful things in quantum as well. Um, you know, if you think about... Um, the aircraft companies that are looking at um, the wingspan and the wing movement and how can how can they reduce that to improve carbon footprints. Uh, lots of things in the medical space companies are working on detecting cancer quicker. Uh, Alzheimer's research, uh, biotech and pharma companies are using it to look at rapid integration of compounds and how they would mix, how they would work. Uh, so lots of lots of good, interesting work in the space. Well, I'll be sure that we share that link to that project that you talked about. So be rest assured that's one thing that we will definitely look at um, in making sure that it's available. And it's interesting that you touch on the other great work that's being done around quantum, you know, for the likes of uh, reducing carbon footprints and obviously medical health research. So it's not all just about the bad guys using quantum, you know, to attack us, but it's certainly something that needs to be front and center. Um, what steps would you advocate that companies can make to ensure that quantum safety is front and center moving forward? Now, so quantum safety would come first before looking at quantum opportunities. And the first few steps would be uh, to do a business impact analysis, to work on uh, understanding what is your cryptographic inventory? What does that look like? Uh, do risk modeling. Um, and from that, you know, looking at maturity models, what is a lot of it is sector driven as well. Where do you need to be in terms of your quantum safety, uh, depending on the sector you're in and where are you now? And then from that point onwards, then the post quantum migration comes in, et cetera. But I don't think there's any need to reinvent the wheel that companies such as Sister, like us, uh, who do all that work for. Uh, that would do all of this for companies and support them with this. Yeah, I, I reviewed quite a few documents you've shared with me to educate me about quantum. And I like the idea of the quantum health risk uh, assessment, you know, because obviously a lot of organizations do assess themselves against relative standards, against different, um, you know, procedures to ensure that they're compliant and meeting um, the necessary standards. Quantum is obviously moving into a new space. Are there any particular standards? I know we talked about Dora. There was an element within Dora where crypto, crypt, cryptography, cryptograph, you're going to have to help me out with that word, cryptography. Cryptography, cryptography. <laughs> there we go. There we go. We won't edit that out. We'll keep it in. Cryptography. Are there any particular standards right now that are highlighting the challenges that quantum um, is going to bring to the business community? Or are there any standards that are saying you, you must now consider quantum as part of your wider um, security requirements? 
Yes, so Dora is really critical because it sort of it has an explicit mention about cryptography in there. Uh, BSI standards have come up. There is mention of uh, some standardizations, and this has come into the latest ISO. Uh, so ISO has started to mention this, and like I said, when it turns so NIST is putting out stuff out there. NCSC has provided timelines. Um, so these are the things to watch out for. It's uh, it's it's here. I know that. Mira, I know that we are watching the clock because I know you've got back-to-back -back meetings all day today. I'm two minutes over schedule. I can only apologize. All that leaves for me to say is Dr. Mira Sama, thank you so much for finally joining me on Let's Talk Cyber. Really pleasure to be here, Tommy.